All right, are you able to see the presentation? Okay, fantastic. All right, well, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I had the um, privilege of being able to attend the uh, Building Business Capabilities BBC conference in October. And so I just wanted to do a, a, a presentation just um, summarizing a couple of my favorite presentations that I was able to attend during that conference. It's a large conference there were, I believe, around 60 presentations given over the course of um, the main week. And then they actually added, because it was virtual, they added another uh, week or two of, of additional bonus presentations, which was great. Uh, so yeah, today will be just me going over a couple, highlighting a couple of those, those presentations. So thanks for joining. All right, for our agenda um, overall, um, I'm just going to do an introduction of myself and then just an overview of the, the conference and how the conference went and what the conference is about. Then I'm going to go into two highlighted presentations. Uh, one was a keynote and the other was uh, just a really great presentation that I, I got a lot of information from on uh, business process architecture. Then I'll just summarize a couple of the other presentations and what I learned from those at a, a higher level, and then just talk about the key takeaways and summary of the conference. And at the end, I'll do Q&A. So if you have questions, please just make note of them. And I'll be happy to take any questions at the end of the presentation. Um, though, if I do say something, if you want to ask questions during the presentation, that's fine. If it's something that applies to that topic, I this doesn't have to be just me talking the entire time. So um, you are welcome to ask questions throughout the presentation, I will say. Uh, but if it's it's more of a, a comment or a, a question outside of the topic that I'm discussing, then um, we can go over those at the end. So. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Celestia Garner. Um, I have over 25 years of experience in technology and I've been at STG Software Technology Group for 12 years. Um, I'm in the product delivery practice at STG, which is a combination of project management, business analysis and business intelligence. And I, my primary skill set uh, of the most recent decade is of uh, being a BA architect or solutions architect, along with project management, BA work, UX design, all sorts of things like that. So I do a little of everything. With, but my main focus is on business analysis and uh, business architecture. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, I will have my contact information at the end of the presentation. So if you um, need more information or if you want to contact me or reach out, let me know. Uh, so the BBC conference, it stands for Building Business Capabilities. I understand when people hear BBC, they often think of the uh, BBC Broadcasting Company and uh, the British Broadcasting Company, but um, this is actually uh, biz building business capabilities. And it's uh, primarily uh, sponsored by the IIBA, the International Institute of Business Analysis. And the IIBA is really the, the industry standard on all things BA. Uh, the conference, though it, it is sponsored by the IIBA and has a big BA focus, uh, a lot of the topics also cover project management, uh, you know, development overall and, and uh, business architecture, a little business intelligence, um, and, and general leadership skills. Um, as most BAs, um, are in some form of a leadership role in their companies, uh, whether that be on the project or overall within the company. Um, and many BAs also over, have overlapping roles that overlap with project management skills. So the conference really covers on all of those different areas. There was also a lot of presentations this year on um, 
on Agile and Agile processes, which are the most common, the most common software methodology used for the field of business analysis. It's just the, the way that uh, software development has, has gone. And so there was a lot of focus on the roles of BAs in Agile and, and that, um, you know, that, that role didn't go away with Agile and it, it's still there and very much um, needed and used. So, so there were quite a few things just talking about just reassuring, not reassuring, but, uh, but reviewing the role of a BA and how that's really evolved over time. So moving along, um, going to go over some of my uh, high, go into more detail on some of my favorite presentations. My favorite presentation of the conference was uh, the systems thinking practical BA techniques for business agility. It's a lot <laughs> to put in one one topic, but I, I will go into that and I'll be breaking that that presentation down and going over that. It, it was really, really great. It was presented by Adrian Reed, who is uh, pretty well known in the uh, technology sector. And it was just a wonderful keynote presentation. And then I'm going to go into the whys and hows of process architecture. And this one was really interesting. It had a lot of different techniques for, um, for uh, process architecture, and it, it went through a really good flow uh, from concept models to context models to finding a North Star goal and and leading into an IGOE, which I'll go into that as well. So those really, those two are really going to be the two that I highlight the most. Um, the keys to successful requirements development was a great presentation. Um, Though I'll be honest, it was a little more conversational and I just have like a few notes. So that one won't be quite as, as long of a summary, but it was a great presentation and, um, and really good information within that one. So I'll go into the details of these highlighted ones and then I'll go over, there were so many presentations. I attended many of them. So um, depending on time and, and where we're at, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe at least provide some of the key takeaways from some of those other presentations that I was able to attend that were that were really helpful. So to start off, uh, I'm going to start with the, like I said, the presentation by Adrian Reed. Um, and uh, and this was really a, a great presentation in that it was presented well and he's he's definitely an a industry expert uh, but he also went into techniques to use for business agility so um, he broke that down into four main topics um, uh, to assess contact context understand perspectives and boundaries understand problem solution or problem situation and purpose and taking action. And this is kind of a cyclical thing that, that you can go round and round on this um, when we're trying to solve problems and, uh, and using system thinking. So overall, let me actually pull up my notes here since I, I do have notes, so I don't just <laughs> go, go, go off rambling. Um, so, one moment here, get my presenter notes up. Okay, all right. Uh, so some of the key takeaways from this presentation. So each present, one thing that I liked about the way that the, um, the BBC conference was held this year. So it was a virtual conference. I guess I didn't really go into that summary very well, but anyway, the BBC conference happens every year. So it's an international BA conference um, and they rotate where it's held every year. So uh, this year it went virtual as with most conferences that happened in 2020. And so with it being virtual, they used the, the app Whova uh, for the presentations and to follow along and provide slides and agendas and things like that. Um, and with each of those agendas, they had 
typically three, but the key takeaways of what you're going to learn from that session. And it made it helpful to, when I was going through picking which presentations to attend, they did have the presentations live. So you could attend the presentation live and have Q and A with the presenter as they were presenting. Uh, the conference has many tracks. I think there's five tracks that, that occur at the same time. So there's a track on leadership, there's a track on, on agile, there's a track on development, there's just different, different tracks for people to follow. And so there are multiple presentations going on at a time, just like any, you know, other large conferences. So when I was going through trying to figure out which ones to attend live, it came down to availability, of course, but then I was able to go through and look through these key takeaways for each to see which ones I really thought would be interesting to attend live. And um, I, I was able to go in and go through several of them after that weren't live, but I really wanted to make sure I was getting the most out of those, those live presentations with the presenters there and able to, uh, you know, have some Q&A and chat with them. So for this presentation, the key takeaways that were, were uh, provided for this are determining what systems thinking is and how it can contribute to, toward business agility. Um, a practical set of systems thinking techniques that have direct applic applicability for BAs and how systems thinking naturally fits with an agile mindset. So the presentation goes in to, um, as I said, uh, four main, I guess I can go back up here, uh, the, the four main uh, practical sets of system thinking. So assessing the context, understanding perspective and boundaries, understand problem situation and propose and taking action. So with each of these topics, they provided, Adrian provided a technique. So a, a BA technique that can be used to apply to this, this um, to that topic. So the first one is assessing context. So for the assessing context, uh, he used what's called a Stacy diagram. So the Stacy diagram looks at, it has, as you can see, it has two axes. It has a horizontal axis, uh, axis um, that goes from close to certainty to far from certainty. Um, so this is really, you're, you're trying to assess something. So you're trying to determine how to plot this um, from, um, how much you know, you know, if you're really certain about something or if you really are not certain about it at all. Um, and then on the vertical axis, we have the why and what, and that goes from close to agreement to far from agreement. So by using this model, you can start looking at, um, at how to apply, uh, you know, how to, how to assess where you are at um, with your process there. So um, the examples that it gives here are, well, not the examples, but um, at the bottom access, it really summarizes the how, um, and the, the left side is the why and what um, for that. So you can see there's different kind of coordinates in here. So if you're close to agreement and close to certainty on making a decision, you're going to be in the realm of rational decision making. Um, if you're close to agreement, but you're moving far from certainty, you're going to be in the judgmental decision making quadrant. Um, adversely, if you're moving up and you're close to certainty, but you're far from agreement, then you're moving into political decision making. When you move outside of these closer segments here, when you're moving farther from having an agreement, you're farther from certainty, you get more into this complex decision making area. And when you get to that farthest corner, that's when you're in chaos. So you can start kind of mapping where you're at with um, when you're uh, um, assessing the context here. Um, I realized I did not give my definitions on the last slide, so I'm going to go back up to the, the previous slide here um, and talk through uh, these, these quotes. So um, when we talk about um, what is systems thinking and how it can contribute towards business agility, um, 
It defines a system as an integrated whole distinguished by its particular purpose for a particular observer. So it's really um, distinguishing uh, from the purpose and the observer. The whole's essential properties arise from the relationships between its parts. Um, and that's from Vickers' appreciative systems model. Um, so if we take that, that concept of what is a system, so a system is, is you know, just a series of, of, um, of relationships, oh, whoops, uh, a, a series of relationships um, coming together for a particular purpose for a particular observer. Um, when we break that down into systems thinking and agility, then we get into um, further detail of, um, of what really is systems thinking and what is business agility. Um, let me see if I have these quotes here. I do not. Okay. Sorry, my notes slide is really small. Let me make that a little bigger so I can actually read my notes. Okay. Um, so as far as systems thinking and business agility, uh, the quotes here, the first quote is from Paul and Gervin, and they said, application of systems thinking helps analysts to enable organizational agility by ensuring that change releases, change releases provide holistic solutions rather than focusing solely on software. So what this really means is that uh, when a lot of people think of agile, they think of just the software um, or just software applying it to software. And this was really saying that that business agility is the way that entire businesses um, take a more agile approach to things um, and uh, releases holistic solutions. Um, so it's really trying to be, bring organizations and, and businesses together. So this whole idea of systems thinking and business agility um, is really about bringing those together, not just looking at a system, which is you know how oh, I look at things because I things because I'm a BA on a software BA, and so you know I'm I'm thinking of the system, but it's really um, making sure that we're also looking at the organizational um, holistic solutions that we're implementing. Uh, the other quote from Robertson and Robertson that was provided was: "Many organizations are coming to realize that business analysis skills and ways of thinking are needed on agile projects." Whether you are called a business analyst or not is irrelevant. Business analysis and systems thinking is one of the prime ingredients for achieving the right outcomes. So this goes along with that, that thread that I mentioned earlier where the conference really was focusing on showing how the BA role is, is very integral, integral in the uh, software development process. So in, in agile projects. They continue to say how systems thinking naturally fits with an agile BA mindset. And it really goes along with the being with making sure you have analysis being done and that you're using using systems thinking. So again, whether you have a, whether you are a BA or you have a BA on a project, that analysis and systems thinking really has to occur somewhere. So if you're able to have a BA on a project, it's much more effective because you have somebody who is solely dedicated to doing that analysis and using that systems thinking. And again, looking at the holistic solutions for an, or at an organizational level. So now that I've actually defined the systems thinking, <laughs> which I skimmed over before, um, we can start looking at how, some of the techniques of how we can apply business agility to our projects using system thinking. So we just talked through the Stacy diagram, which is a way of assessing the context for, um, for systems thinking. Another way, uh, another technique and step is, well, another step in systems thinking is understanding perspectives and boundaries. 
And one of the techniques for understanding perspectives and boundaries is called CHS, CSH, stands for Critical Systems Heuristics. Now, this is a really complex kind of scientific model that can be used when you are, are trying to understand uh, perspectives and boundaries. And the perspectives and boundaries that are trying to be understood here are looked at both on the system side, so the, the what does the system need to do, as well as on the user side, so, so who will be interacting with this. So there are a lot of steps. I, I just highlighted two of the steps in the process, so the first step and the last step. Uh, the presentation was great. I highly recommend if you're, you're able to, you know, maybe do a little bit more research on this uh, critical systems heuristics, but it's uh, a really, really fascinating process to go through. So uh, rather than, I mean, I could do a whole presentation just on, on this. So rather than taking up too much time on that, I'm going to just highlight what, uh, how this process works. So it starts out with a grid, um, a grid format. And so there's questions along this grid system here. So you've got your, um, along the top, you're asking for role specific concerns. You're looking at the roles of who will be doing this and what are some of the key problems that we're trying to solve with the system. And then as we look down the, uh, the, uh, the vertical here, we start looking at some of the questions and deeper levels of focus. And, and really the process looks into each of these in a lot more detail. But uh, so we look at the sources of motivation, the sources of power, the sources of knowledge, and the sources of legitimation. So um, in doing this, we can go through each, um, sorry, each box here and go into a series of questions to really understand across this grid. Um, so when we're looking at sources of more motivation, when we're looking at role specific concerns, we're looking at things like the purpose of this um, and some of the key problems we're looking at are measurements of improvement, for example. So the, the presentation, he just picked this, for, this first line here to, to show as an example to go into more detail and more detail um, and more depth to, as we went through the process. Um, so, so we have our grid, we go through and we, we start um, defining this grid here for the system and then we do it again for the user. So we really are trying to look at it again from both, both approaches of, you know, how, how is this affecting, what are these, um, what are the critical systems needed for the, the system to handle and for the user to handle. And then ultimately, by breaking all of these things down, doing a series of analysis and all of that information, um, we're able to uh, create a systems map that kind of identifies what's inside or what's outside. So really looking at what's changing and from whose perspective. So when we look at the, the model that we have here on this right side, um, what we're trying to focus on here is it, it, at the core, um, well, oh, so you can see the, the details here. So the example that he gave was uh, for a phlebo phlebotomy lab that does blood draws and um, goes through this whole uh, health care process and to narrow it down to one specific item that we, you know, blew out into more detail. So um, by using this example and going through the course, we came up, he, he was able to create this, this, um, model here. And here it's it's really looking at what is in the center here uh, for um, what the system, so we this is the system example. Um, but when we look at this, we look at what's inside, what's outside, what's changing, and from whose perspective. So from the perspective of the system, the system here needs to diagnose a patient's illness. And that's really what's on the inside. This is the core of what it needs to do. And these are a couple of the different ways of how it can do that. These are just samples, obviously. And then just outside of that ring is a system, um, 
So this, the inner core is a system to diagnose the patient's illness. Just outside of that is a system to treat the patient's illness. And just outside of that is a system to keep people well. And so those are the three kind of key things that this, um, that this using this critical systems heuristics model, when they were trying to really understand um, the perspectives and boundaries of what they were trying to create by breaking that down, they were able to come up with a, a really good picture of where they needed to focus their efforts and what, what was the, you know, what was on the inside being what, what is the, the really core of, of the, what the system needs to do. Um, and, and then what are the layers to that? And then overall what's changing. So what are the processes that are changing and, and is that changing at a system level? Is that changing at a user level? Next up was to understand the problem situation. And so when looking at how to understand the problem situation, they use this external environment analysis, EEA, called Steeple. And Steeple is a, um, initialism for so something that is social, technological, economic, environmental, political, legal, and ethical. So by looking at these different, different elements um, to understand a problem, so looking at a problem situation and trying to analyze and figure, understand that problem situation better, we can apply, we can look at these different aspects of the problem and how they're affected. We can use what's called a multiple cause diagram for each event and state to determine what is needed in the system and what is outside the system. So uh, again, another really complex model, but it's a really great technique when you are, are trying to figure out large environmental um, external factors to a problem and looking at it at from each of these different you know each of these different areas external areas to understand the implications of what it is you're trying to accomplish and how where some of the problems might arise and also making sure that you're covering off on all of these different areas and then, like I said, just continuing on to do a multiple cause diagram where you can start again doing these circles of kind of what's on the inside, what's at our core of the system, what are the different layers, so what is the main focus, uh, what is the main problem we're trying to solve, and, um, and then what are the, the supporting areas to that. So steeple is the initialism for that. I recently was corrected on using the term acronym and initialism, so I'm trying to use the proper term, I, you know, it's never too late to learn things, and so, yeah, just trying to make sure I'm using the proper grammar and terminology there. Uh, all right, so the fourth step in our practical BA techniques for business agility is to propose and take action. And so this process, uh, this, this step uses two techniques uh, to, to really help with the determining business agility um, and using systems thinking. So the first is the brown cow model and then the second is called backcasting. So looking at the brown cow model, um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're looking at a grid format here. And on our grid, we're, we've got our axes and we're looking at uh, the future. So the future and what? So this is looking, this quadrant is in the future, and what here? We move down into the next quadrant, which is looking at the how and in the future. So again, this is when we're, we're proposing to take action um, on something. So when we're trying to come up with that, we're first looking at what is needed in the future um, and then how we're going to do that in the future 
Then when we move into the now, we look at the how are we going to do this now? And then we get up to the what and now. And this is a, a, a circle, um, a, you know, again, a cycle that goes round and round. But when you're starting a project, you're really looking at the, you know, what is it that we need to do in the future? And then you can determine how are we going to do that? But then when you get into the now of actually doing that, as, as those of us who work on agile projects know, you can do planning and forecasting ahead of time, but until you really get into the project and get going, you really do have to reassess how you're going to do it now that you're in, that you're in it when you're doing it. And, and ultimately, what are you going to, what is going to be your final outcome and, and what is the final outcome in the now? And from there, you can start the cycle over again by saying, okay, so in the future, we're going to need this. So looking at things like future enhancement. So we're, we're creating this piece of functionality in a system, for example. And so it, it's something that we've looked at and we've needed uh, and that we know that we need. But once we start building it, then we start realizing, oh, there's other things that, that we could really use this for in other areas that we can expand on this feature. And so, you know, those become kind of feature enhancements and, and go into, then we start the cycle again of, okay, so if we do this feature enhancement, you know, what is that going to be? How are we going to do it? Gets implemented. And that can sometimes spark even more ideas and things. So there's kind of these offshoots of, of ideas and, and features that, that expand and, and grow as we go through that agile process. So looking at this backcasting model, there's a couple steps to this, and I, I just pulled the um, the last version of you know screen capture of of this process, but this follows this trend of um, we have this predicted future, right, and uh, what we think is going to happen. We have our current situation, and so our, from our current situation, we can trend and determine what we think the future is going to be. Um, but as we get started on a project, it typically takes us in a slightly varied path, um, which is usually a little bit different than our original future desired situation. So what we do in Agile is along the way, we're, we're asking questions and we still have to get to a final product, but we can have these offshoots of, of new ideas and, and thoughts that can be implemented throughout. Um, so, for example, we've learned about where we need to go to get, we've learned about where we need to get to, let's regroup and rethink. And so this goes along with that, that business agility and, and agile methodology overall of continually it reviewing um, where we're at in the process and how we want to, so what we're doing and how we want to do that and just continue that cycle until we have a full feature that is accommodating all of the needs of the system, all of the needs of the users and overall using systems thinking to come up with these final solutions. So that is the overview of the systems thinking practical BA techniques for business agility. Um, again, this was presented by Adrian Reed. And so by going through this, through this presentation, by going through these, these four steps here throughout the systems thinking process, we're able to come up with several techniques that we've been able to identify of how to how systems thinking fits within an agile mindset on projects. All right, so next up, uh, so that was the biggest one. That was one of the keynotes, and I know I've I've got a little a little long on on that overview, but like I said, it was a lot of really great information, and I really loved the way that it was presented. It was really helpful, and I liked how he provided real world techniques on how to approach different steps in the systems learning process. So, again, if you have questions on that, please reach out to me afterward and let me know, and I'd be happy to um, talk through in a little bit more detail or uh, guide you on where you can find more information on that presentation. 
All right, so the next one that uh, I really chose two because I had a feeling I was going to go over three main ones. I had a feeling I was going to go over on time. That happens. So I really only did detailed slides for the two. So the one that we just looked at by Adrian Reed. The next one is the whys and hows of process architecture. Um, so this one, get to my notes on that, uh, was two presenters. So Eunice McCharles and Lee Yang were from IIBA, uh, were the presenters on the whys and hows of process architecture. So the key learning objectives or key takeaways from this presentation of, of, of what it covered was challenges with typical process redesign efforts and how process architecture answers them. Establishing a draft high level process architecture and the importance of having North Star goals. And then they talk through their process of I, IGO, the IGO model or IGOE model. So I'm going to go into each of these sections um, and I will probably go through them a little bit quicker than the other one. But so this started out talking about process architecture. So it starts talking uh, by talking about really what is process architecture. Um, and it there's a didn't write down the reference of, of who said this. But anyway, they had a quote in the presentation of, of uh, what process architecture is. And it, it's defined as a framework to help an organization to visualize and understand through an organizational and solutional agnostic view, use common language and across all of the organization, not just systems, for the delivered value of all processes to enable value and agile changes and properly assess and organize. That is not the exact quote, but that is my summarized view of a quote. Um, so uh, anyway, the framework really is there um, to, to help. So process architecture is creating a framework to help us visualize and understand um, to particularly use common language across the organization, not just systems language. And this is one of the areas that a BA really comes in, where it's nice to have a BA on a project because they're really good at using that, determining that common language and having that common language known across all of the organizational units. Um, so when we're talking about particular business processes, that, that an organization, it's their terminology of how this process works, that um, the development team understands what that language is. And then alternatively, the, uh, the language that the development team is using to implement the solution is understood by the organizational units. So it's really having that um, that agnostic view of the solution and making sure that everybody's able to visualize and understand across the organization that you can have that common language that people understand. Um, and then we've got, uh, like I said, the the ability to deliver value um, for their processes um, and enable valuable and agile changes. Um, so that's done by properly assessing and organizing um, what is what is changing throughout what we're doing. Um, and again, that goes back up to are we doing a redesign or are we doing a, <laughs> um, you know, what, what are exactly are we doing? Are we doing a redesign? Are we building something new? But having that framework in the beginning um, will really help that move along. So there's a couple of, of um, processes that it, this follows and it, it starts out, miss a slide here. Okay. Um, so in process architecture, um, there's a typical process analysis 
process, which is kind of a confusing way to word it. Um, and that is um, improve, determining if we're doing improvements or re-engineering efforts. Um, these often fail because they start from a soil position, they focus on steps instead of resulting value, they cannot identify impacted processes, they cannot accurately, accurately identify which areas need improvement, they are not clear on unintended impacts or they're discovered too late, and each change requires analysis from scratch. So these are some of the reasons that, that, that some process improvements and re-engineering efforts often fail. And so using process architecture is meant to do the opposite of that, to address each of these issues that come up and then making sure that we are putting proper processes in place to address those and using proper architecture frameworks from the beginning to make sure that we're creating a valuable solution. So a couple of the ways that they do this is by one of them being creating a context model. So a context model is a representation, graphic, or other of the physical or informational items that are exchanged between an organization and the external organization or stakeholders in its environment. Um, a, a sample context model will show what are the products what are the services and the flows for your stakeholders? Um, are they healthy? Um, are, so really just determining um, the context there. The context model needs to be scoped appropriately. If it's too narrow, you'll get an incomplete picture of what the customer interactions are. It needs to be complete for each stakeholder. So you, you'll need to do separate context models for each of the state key stakeholders for a project. And it needs to be updated as the organization learns more um, or as the project changes or progresses. So again, with that, that agility mindset of making sure that you know, you can create the context model, you can scope it, you can make sure it's done for each stakeholder, but it's it's best if that is able to be updated as you learn. So again, using that agile approach to, to being able to make changes as things are identified, because we don't always know everything at the beginning. Um, so really just having that ability to be updated. And I have... Here. Did not get this added into my slides, but I do have the images here. I just didn't get them added, but um, hopefully you can see that. It's a little blurry, but this is an example of, that is actually an example of a concept model, but this is an example of the context model here. And so the context model is, I'm not sure why that, that but uh, the context model has the again you'll do this per stakeholder so in this example they used a bakery so the bakery is the key stakeholder and then the context model is just looking at um, again clarifying um, looking at uh, making sure that we're sco we're covering scope that we are um, understanding what are the products, what are the services, and how do they flow to, to the stakeholder. So you've, you've got the key stakeholder here, but then you have each of the other stakeholders out, out here. And so figuring out how the information flows back and forth. So from here, the bakery sends an invoice to the customer, the customer sends a payment to the bakery, um, the customer places an order, the bakery you know, creates a custom product, they give a loyalty credit. So anyway, there's these different understanding that flow of, of products and services back and forth between each. So what, what does the bakery interact with the investors? How does the bakery interact with the staff? What do they need to do for their staff? What do they need to do with suppliers? What do they need to do with government agencies and authorities? They have to have permits and inspections and payments and things like that. So that when you when you put things in context, this is really about trying to figure out these the the flow of information. So it's it's that kind of the the how and what. 
So then when we move from the concept model, we move to the context model. So the context model um, is, again, a, usually a graphical uh, representation of the physical or informational items that are exchanged. So the, um, oh, sorry, that was the concept, context model that we just talked about. It's the concept model uh, is the next one. So the concept model is the example of the stakeholders and items and information that must be managed by an organization or value chain with defined relationships between each. So um, this, again, is where we are looking at that model. And in that model, we want to clarify and, and differentiate the nouns. So who is doing what, the processes, um, which are, and solutions, and which are agnostic. Um, we want to define it across the organization, explain relationships, um, and make sure, again, that it can be updated as, as the project goes. Then we take a look at the North Star goal. And the North Star goals um, are a set of intentions that an organization or value chain will strive to reach as part of its strategic, strategic intent. It contains vectors and it's weighted. So the North Star goal is typically about five to seven statements. And it consists of a vision. So really, how will you grow? How will we grow our business profitably and become known as the best cake shop in our town? So that was the example that they used. So just a, a vision sentence here. Um, and then providing, like I said, five to seven statements on how they're going to accomplish that that goal or that vision. So they they the goals that they set for this sample was to increase revenue, increase service reliability, decrease environmental impact, sustain quality of a product, and license agreements. Um, so the North Star goals need to be um, measurable goals. They need to be weighted. They need to not describe solutions or work efforts. They need to be, um, rather than describing a solution, they need to describe um, more the, the what they're trying to accomplish. Um, they should prov provide guidance for pain and gain analysis, which is another part of the presentation that I won't go into, but um, another great analysis technique. And they'll provide guidance for process level goals. So then we move into the process architecture. So we've now looked at a concept model, come up with the initial concept, um, the kind of who's and what's. Um, we did a context model to gather physical information and determine what will be exchanged and what we're trying to accomplish uh, both internally and externally. We've created a North Star goal. So we've basically created a vision statement and determined some of the goals that we want to accomplish. Then we get into the process architecture. Um, so this is the representation of the business processes that an organization conducts. It shows all the work that's performed by an organization um, and states things like value and to both the organization and stakeholders. And um, it needs to, so the process architecture needs to be processes. So we need to use verb plus noun. So marketing does this, development does this, QA does this. So it needs to be um, it, it needs to be defined in, in a verb noun structure. They're not aligned to organizational structure. So it, it cautions to be not to not to define or avoid terms. It cautions to um, not define or use terms that have specific meanings to your organization. So when you're trying to put together the process architecture, again, it's good to be more agnostic, not just using your company lingo, but using actual industry terms so that it's a little bit more clear on what you're trying to do and better understood. Um, it needs to be defined, differentiated, and understood across the organization. 
um, and cover all items and exchanges identified in the context and concept models. And there's, there's again, linkage that, that brings that all back. So the process architecture needs to kind of take all of those previous steps that we talked about and put them all together um, and make sure that we're, we're looking at things in a whole. Um, it then talks through a pain and gain analysis, which I won't go into, um, and then this IGO process. So the, the IGO process is taking a look at input, guides, outputs, and enablers. Um, and so it, it looks at things like a trigger, um, an endpoint, so a trigger being like a custom, custom order is received, um, an endpoint, the custom cake is completed and ready for pickup and invoicing. Um, and then we can identify the inputs and outputs um, of, of what's happening there. And guides, guides would be things like, for their bakery example, it was like the recipe, they use, um, they have a menu, there's safety rules, there's what are the guides that help them accomplish what they need. And then there's the enablers, there's kitchen staff, there's appliance, there's kitchen utensils. Those are the things that enable them to do their job um, to create the outputs. Um, and the outputs are based off of that input of what the customer requested. Um, so here's the list of, of what the IGO needs to do. I'll go ahead and skim past that. Um, in, in addition to that, we've got, uh, there's govern governance and maintenance that, that needs to occur. And ultimately we get down to the benefits of the process architecture. So the benefits of using, of having a full process architecture um, that is built into um, the, the kind of why and how we go through this process of architecture and following the different processes and techniques that are outlined in here. Um, say process improvement um, efforts within a process architecture framework. It starts from an enterprise wide understanding. The organization can easily identify impacted areas uh, can accurately identify which areas need improvement, unintended impacts are minimized, waste can be easily identified, changes or analysis for changes can be made quickly, and KPIs and measurements are understood across the organization. So these are the benefits that you ultimately get from going through this kind of arduous process, um, but the process architecture itself provides enough benefit that it's worth taking the effort if you have the time and resources to go through this process. All right, so um, we are running low on time, so I'm going to just skim through the rest, but some of the other presentations of notes, these are some of the other presentations that I, I found in, incredibly helpful. Um, there was one on the keys to successful requirements development, um, practical BA techniques for business agility, uh, the agile requirement and new definition, how fintech is innovating and transforming uh, the financial digital sector. And then the conference ended with a presentation by the president of the IIBA, the International Institute of Business Analysis. And he talked about business analysis in the new decade. And really, he talked a little bit about where, where the field of business analysis has, how it's evolved to where we are now, and looking ahead to, you know, where we see the field going in the future. And, and really just to summarize that amazing presentation where he where he really talked about things going is the field of business analysis really being broken down into the different roles. So um, there are so many different functions and types. Business analysis is really a big umbrella term for so many uh, roles and responsibilities and functions. And so they're being better and better defined and roles are being created for not necessarily niche, but but smaller, uh, these smaller roles of business analysis that can, can really be a little bit better honed in and, and specific. So things like having a systems analysis and, um, and process analysis and even breaking things down into, you know, a product owner, a product manager, a um, you know, data analysis. There's so many different types of, of BA roles and functions. And so really what he was, what he ultimately was 
was alluding to is just the um, the umbrella term of business analysis. So people are probably the industry has shifted and will likely continue to shift more into using those broken down terms, those smaller, more granular terms for what people are doing rather than just saying, oh, we need a BA. OK, well, what kind of BA do you need? There's lots of types of 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 roles of a business analyst. And so rather than, than saying we need a BA, they're going to say we need a data analyst or we need, um, you know, a, a process analyst. Uh, we need a, 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 a business analyst architect. We need, um, you know, so just going through those different types of BAs and that in the future, we see it really the industry has been leaning that way and will continue to lean that way that rather than saying I need a BA on a project, people will better understand those those kind of subcategory roles of what a BA does on a project and and will be sourcing and looking for those more specific roles versus having the catch all BA that can do everything. So overall, um, I, you know, have went through, I highlighted those two main, uh, the two main keynote, the keynote and, and the main presentations that I really enjoyed and got the most out of. Uh, again, they were ones that had more applicable techniques that, that can be used immediately on projects. And, and I can take a look at that and say, okay, I'm, I'm doing this type of thing. What, what are some of the tools and techniques I can use? And now I have more of these in my toolbox that I can go back and reference and that I was able to learn about from this conference. Um, again, these are some of the other really great presentations, really, really good information. These are more BA focused. Again, that's because that's my primary role is as a business analyst. There were many other presentations in here. And overall, it was just a great, great conference. I'm really, really grateful that STG was um, able and willing to pay for me to attend this conference this year. It's not a cheap conference. Um, but it's well worth it. And uh, I, I really learned a lot as I always do. So that is my presentation. So I'll open it now. We have just three minutes left and I apologize. I didn't leave more time for questions, but um, are there any questions? It's a lot of information. Um, I will share my slides. Uh, so I'll, I'll send those to Jen and see if we can find a way to share those with those who attended. And uh, again, my, con my contact information is on the slide. So if you'd like more detail on, on what I presented today or if any of the other presentations sparked interest, or if you'd like to know more about the Building Business Capabilities Conference overall, then please let me know. Celeste, so we will put the recording on our STG YouTube channel, assuming that when my network connection just got lost, that it still is working. So <laughs> yes. it will be available there. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out of your lunch hour to learn more about this conference. And, and hopefully you were able to um, at least learn some techniques or or processes that you can maybe apply or better understand how these processes are being implemented to affect your role on projects. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks last year. Great job. Thank you.